Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon, class. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, we are going to review the materials that you have uh, gone through this week, right? We are going to review the materials that you have gone through this week, which is on the real-time operating system, inter-thread communication, okay? Uh, but before that, um, I'm going to take your attendance and one more thing is the quiz, right? So uh, we're going to discuss the RTOS InterTrack Communication uh, Quiz 9 eh, after this. So uh, those of you who have already submitted but you forgot to press the turn in button, eh, can you press it now? Right? Uh, so they are uh, uh, Bun Kiong, Ka Sing, Lok Jing, and Yao Ting. Eh? Okay. No. Ah, Yao Ting. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, Lok Jing and Ka Sing. Right. And Bun Kiong. So you haven't uh, pressed the turn in button yet. Make sure you press the turn in button eh, after you finish your quiz. Right. Okay. So uh, uh, try to do that now before we start the quiz before we start discussing the quiz later, okay? Right, so let me come back here. And uh, let me take your attendance first before we start the class. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, Brenda, are you here? Brenda, good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you, Alok Jing. Uh, Chen Su Pian, Chen Su Pian, Chia Tai Siu, Chu Zhang Hing, Chu Zhang Hing, Chua Yu Yang, Chua Yu Yang, Okay, uh, Ernest, Ernest, we can sing Hu Hing Dong, Hu Hing Dong, Hu Wun Kiong, Hu Wun Kiong, All right? Wun Kiong, remember to turn in your uh, quiz nine, uh, uh, Lok Jing, Lok Jing, okay, uh, Li Zhe Lim, right? Lim Chun Wei, Lim Wen Yang, Lim Wen Yang, Lim, Lim Yong Chuan, Lim Yong Chuan, okay, Long Yao Ting, right? Good afternoon. I uh, think remember to turn in your uh, quiz line. Uh. Okay, Pyong Lia, Min. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Han Xiang. All right, hey, Wei Hong. Ng Wei Hong. Ng Wei Hong. All right, Ong Mei Lin. Hey, Pong Shui Wen. Pong Shui Wen. Uh, Kwa Yi Hang. Kwa Yi Hang. Kwa Yi Hang. So Yun Cheng. Uh, Kwa Yi Hang. Uh, Han Xinxin, Han Xinxin, Han Xinxin, Kyo Leong Ho, Kyo Yi Si, Kyo Yi Si, right? Wong Chong Yi, okay, Wong Ka Sing. Uh, Ka Sing, remember to turn in your quiz nine, eh? uh, Yong Wing Liang, Yong Wing Liang, Yong Si Ye, Yong Si Ye. Okay, uh, I'll check your attendance again uh, later. Let me just check again. Uh, Chu Zhang Hing, are you here? Chu Zhang Hing? Chu Zhang Hing? Chu Zhang Hing? Um, Hong Shui Wen? Hong Shui Wen? Hong Shui Wen? Tan Xinxin? Tan Xinxin? Yong Wing Liang, Yong Xie? Yong Wing Liang, Yong Xie? Okay. Right, um, now. Last week, what we did was, uh, last week, uh, what we did was, we talked about the real-time operating system, okay? You were introduced to the real-time operating system uh, last week, right? And you looked at the kernel and the task manager, okay? So specifically inside the kernel, uh, we have uh, objects for thread and time management, and we have objects to allow threads to communicate with each other. So we talked about thread and time management last week. You know, we have the APIs, the functions uh, for you to create threads, manage threads, and then uh, the functions for the virtual timers. Okay, so all of these are managed by the kernel. Now, today we are going to talk about these six objects uh, which allow threads to communicate with each other, pass data between each other, Synchronize their activity. Synchronize their activity means uh, um, synchronizing means in time. In time. For example, uh, uh, let's say um, we are doing something. Uh, let's say we are doing something 
So synchronizing means, let's say every, every two times I do it, you do it three times. Okay, for example, let's say we are jumping. So I jump two times, you jump three times. So for every two times that I jump, you will jump three times. So we are synchronizing what we are doing, right? Like, you know, the Olympic diving, uh, synchronized uh, diving. Uh, so the, the, the two divers, uh, they move, they do the same thing at exactly the same time, right? When they, when they jump, they jump at the same time. When they turn, they turn at the same time. So their activities uh, are synchronized with each other, right? Coordinated in time with each other. So those are the two things uh, that we use inter-track communication objects for. Now, the last one uh, is... Uh, managing resource sharing. Okay. Uh, just one moment. Right, thank you. Huh? Okay. Now the last one is managing resource sharing. Resource sharing means uh, a resource that is used by multiple threads, something that is shared. Okay. An example I like to use is uh, a networked printer in your office. So let's say all of you are working in an office, right? And there is only one shared printer. It's a network printer. So let's say there are four of you. You all of you are send things to the printer to print at the same time. So what is going to happen? Well, there are two ways that the, of the outcome. There are two possible outcomes. The first possible outcome is the printer will print a little bit from the first person, print a little bit from the second person, print a little bit from the fourth, third person print a little bit from the fourth person and then go back to the first person and so on. So what comes out of the printer, the printed paper that comes out is going to be nonsense because it's going to contain things printed out by four percent. It's nonsense. So we don't want that. So we need to manage this printer, this shared resource. How do we manage? When four persons send things to the printer to print at the same time, the printer will print things from one person at one time. So the printer will print from the first person, print until finished. Then it will print from the second person, print until finished. Print, print from the third person, print until finished. Print from the fourth person, print until finished. So the idea is uh, the printer can only print from one person at any one time. Only one person is allowed access to the shared resource at any one time. We call this managing the shared resource. So we do, we do all this uh, using these objects. Okay, so let's start with the first one, signals. Signals allow you to synchronize track activity. Let's see how it's done. So uh, let's say here, uh, I, have, uh, I have three tracks, track A, track B, and track C. I have three tracks, track A, track B, and track C. Okay, now what I want to do is, uh, I want track A to run. Uh,
uh, sorry class, my PC just crashed, uh, so uh, I've just restarted my PC. Uh. Uh, very sorry for the delay. Okay. Um, right, uh, can everyone see my screen? Okay, all right, so let me continue. Uh. Let me continue. Uh. Right, so just now we were, we were talking about, uh, okay. just now we were talking about, uh, I have three threads. Thread A, thread B, and thread C. Okay, so I want to synchronize the execution such that uh, thread A will only run after thread B and thread C has run. How do I do that? So I use the signal functions. The signal functions. The signal functions are here, right? These are the signal APIs. API just means application programming interface. API or application programming interface, uh, it refers to those uh, some high level functions that does something for you. You don't need to worry about the low level coding. Okay, So here, uh, the high level function is setting a signal, uh, setting a signal, waiting for a signal and clearing a signal. These are the high level functions. So how are they actually coded? Uh? the setting signal, waiting for the signal, clearing the signal. How are they actually coded? Ah, you don't need to know because you are not writing this operating system. You are just using it. So you don't need to know how these functions are written. Okay, That's what we mean by API functions. API functions, uh, they allow you to do some high level stuff. You don't need to be bothered about how they are actually working underneath the code that is working under the hood. Right. We call these uh, APIs, Application Programming Interface. You can interface uh, and use the things without knowing how it actually works underneath. Okay, So the, your APIs uh, for signals are signal wait, signal set, signal clear. Okay, You can wait for a signal. So you specify what is the signal you are waiting for and how long you are going to wait. Signal set is you specify which thread the thread ID, which thread you want to set the signals, and these are the signals. Signal clear is also the same thing. You specify which is the thread you want to clear signals, and these are the signals. So what do we mean by signals actually? Now, each thread has a total of 31 signal flags. Now, this is a 32-bit uh, container, but only 31 bits are implemented, right? We only use 31 bits for signal flags. Huh? And how many signal flags you want, you define inside your uh, header file. In your CMC's OS.h header file, huh? you can define how many signals you want. By default, eight signal flags are used. OS feature signals, eight. Eight signal flags are used. Okay, so that means uh, each thread actually has eight signal flags. Okay, so now, what happens is, uh, what happens is, how do we do this synchronization? Okay, thread A. When thread A starts running, uh, thread A will wait for the signal uh, tree. Tree means binary one one. Uh. Tree means binary one one. So thread A uh, is waiting for the signal tree, and it's going to wait forever. So it goes into a waiting state. Thread's got three state: ready, running, and waiting. So when thread A runs, it executes this line of code, OS signal wait, it's going to wait for these flags, so it goes into a waiting state, right? Then B runs, okay. So what happens when B runs? As you can see from here, we got thread A, thread B, and thread C. So thread A is running until it executes the OS signal wait. So thread A goes into a waiting state. Thread A uh, is waiting for somebody to set his uh, first and second flag. Right? First and second flag. Three, ma. three means, you see, three means, 0x03 zero zero means 1x1. One, one. So A uh, is waiting for somebody to set his, these two flags so that he can continue execution. Right? Then thread B runs. Thread B, thread B uh, then runs. When thread B runs, uh, thread B sets signal 0x01 of thread A. So that's the first flag. 
zero x zero one will set the first part. How we do that? Eh? Okay, let's zoom out a little bit, eh? and then you can see from here. Eh? So track B, after track B run, track B sets track A this signal. Okay, set this signal. So the first one set already, but the second one not yet set. Also, track A is still waiting. Eh? Still waiting. Okay. Then track B, you see, uh, track B, it will continue running until the end of its time slice. So here, uh, at this point, uh, uh, the processor will switch, not the processor, uh, the operating system, uh, the task manager will switch to track C because track B, the time slice over already. So switch to track C. As you know, uh, in an operating system, each track is only allowed to run for a certain amount of time. We call that its time slice. So track B can only run for this much. So after, when it reaches the end of the time that it is allowed to run, no? the task manager will switch to the next track, which is track C. So track C then starts running. And what does track C do? Uh? So you can see from here, uh, what does track C do? Track C, after uh, doing its processing, no? it signals track A the second flag. Uh, track C uh, signals track A the second flag. So Track A, the second flag has been uh, signaled at this point. Track C is running uh, at this point. Uh, it signals the second flag of track A. So track A, uh, now all its flags have been signaled already. So track A is immediately uh, goes to a ready state. Track A uh, changes from waiting state to ready state. It's ready to run, but not its turn yet uh, because C is still running. Uh. So at the end of track C's time slice, oh, the, the operating system will switch to track A and track A starts running. So this is how we use uh, signals. Uh, right? We can trigger a track to run uh, using signals. We just make the track wait for a certain set of signals and then other tracks uh, can set these signals. So once all the signals that a track is waiting for has been set, then this track can continue running again. Okay, now, uh, so this is how we synchronize track execution. And a very useful application of this uh, is interrupt handling. Let's look at this example of interrupt handling. Okay, interrupt handling. Now, you know that uh, your real time operating system uh, runs on clock ticks, right? Your RTOS uh, runs on clock ticks. It's very important that these clock ticks uh, happen on time. For example, uh, you know that the RTOS clock ticks are generated by the system tick timer. Let's say every one millisecond. Uh, so the system tick timer uh, must be able to run every one millisecond. Who can disturb this? Other interrupts, right? If there are any other interrupts uh, that has higher priority than SysTick, uh, that can disturb SysTick, right? And if, if they run long enough, uh, then you might miss your cystic every one millisecond, cannot run. So what happens is uh, to minimize, to minimize the interrupt coding uh, from disrupting the RTOS operation, we write our interrupt service routines to be as short as possible. Okay, so this is the interrupt service routine. We write it uh, to be as short as possible. How? Eh? Just one single line of code. OS signal set. Okay. Uh, of course, there is another line that uh, you need to clear the interrupt flag. Uh. Uh, I didn't write that because not all interrupt handlers, you need to clear the interrupt flag, only some. Okay. So, but we should add it here, uh, clear the interrupt flag. So, uh, whenever an interrupt happens, you will go to the interrupt service routine, right? But you don't put the ISR code here. You shift the interrupt service routine code to a track. Put it here. The ISR code, uh, you don't put in the IRQ handler. You put it in a track. You call that track uh, the ISR track, uh, whatever the name. Uh. And then this track, uh, it will a signal. This signal is set by the, the interrupt service routine. Okay, So whenever the interrupt happens, the interrupt service routine will run. The interrupt service routine will signal uh, signal this track to run. And this track does the interrupt service routine processing like uh, the code. Uh. So what is the difference? The difference is 
we do the ISR coding uh, inside a thread, right? And threads, uh, they are controlled by the operating system. Uh, so everything is managed nicely. Uh. This interrupts, uh, they are not controlled by the operating system. So they disturb the RTOS operation. So to minimize the disturbance to the RTOS, these interrupt handlers, we write the code to be as short as possible. Basically just one OS signal set line to signal the ISR thread to run, okay? All right, so this is uh, all about uh, signals, uh, signals, synchronizing. Now let's look at the next item uh, where we manage resource sharing. How do we manage uh, resource sharing between threads? How do we ensure that only one thread can use the shared resource at any one time. Uh, so we talk about the semaphore and the mutex, uh, the semaphore and the mutex. And uh, I use a very easy to understand um, example. I use a very easy to understand example, which is, uh, you know, these public toilets. Where do you see these public toilets? You know, last time when there was no MCO, uh, you have those uh, large outdoor events those huge outdoor events, those uh, singing concerts uh, or those uh, marathons, uh, those running events. Uh. So you have lots of these uh, public toilets set up, uh, temporary toilets. Uh. Okay, so this toilet, the door lock, uh, red color means it's locked, green color means it's open. Right? And it's locked from the inside. So a person goes in, he locks the door. Then when, when another person comes, uh, he see the door is locked. Uh, oh, cannot go in, uh, then have to line up and wait. Uh. So this is the same idea about the semaphore. The semaphore uh, is the lock. The semaphore is the lock. Okay. So let's say uh, we only got one shared resource. We only got one shared resource, one toilet. So the semaphore value will be one. The semaphore value uh, indicates how many shared resources there are. So if the semaphore value is one, that means there's only one shared resource. Uh, okay. So when the thread comes, uh, uh, wait and wait for this semaphore, wait for this shared resource. If the shared resource is available, then this thread will immediately use the shared resource, right? So if it uses the shared resource, then, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, the, you, you saw this, or if you go to the PPV, or you see this, but don't go in. It's very, just when, when you go for your vaccination, or don't drink water, so you don't go to your toilets, it's not hygienic. Anyway, yeah. Um, when you get the semaphore, so what are the functions to get the semaphore? Okay, these are the functions to get the semaphore. So you, you see, it it looks like the signal, right? OS signal. So you got the OS semaphore ID. You need an ID for the semaphore. And then you need to define the semaphore. OS semaphore create, create the semaphore just like you create threads. Okay, because the semaphore will take up memory space. So you need to create the semaphore. And then uh, you wait for a semaphore, you release a semaphore, and you delete a semaphore. So when, when you wait for the semaphore, uh, you will go into waiting state uh, if the semaphore is not available. Uh. But let's say uh, the semaphore value is 1. So when you execute OS semaphore wait, wait, you want to get the semaphore. If it's 1, then you will successfully get it. When you get it, uh, the value will minus 1. So the semaphore from 1 becomes 0. Means no more already. So C is now using it. So the value becomes zero. Now, if A, B, and D comes, uh, they, they execute OS uh, semaphore wait, uh, they will all go into a waiting state because the semaphore value is zero, not available. Okay, so C will do its job. So once C is done, then C comes out of the toilet. Uh, C executes OS semaphore release. When you execute OS semaphore release, you will increment the semaphore value by one. You release it, so re increment by one. So the semaphore value become one again. When it become one again, uh, see who came first. Uh? Just now A came first. Uh? So A will get the semaphore that was released by C. So A gets the semaphore. And immediately the semaphore value from one go back to zero because now it's obtained by A. So A will uh, use the shared resource now. A use the toilet. Uh? So when A is done, A releases it. The semaphore goes back to one, then B gets it and B run, release it, and then, then C gets it, C runs, and then release it like this. Okay, so let's see uh, how it is uh, used. Let's see how it is used. I have an example here. Okay, so now here, uh, 
I have a program. I have a program here. I want to write to the microcontroller UART, Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. UART is also known as serial port. Okay, so I want to write something to the serial port. This is what I want to write. This is what I want to write. This is what I want to write. So I got thread one and thread two. Thread one uh, will write 10 ones to the serial port. U, U R T X means you transmit to the serial port. Uh. So thread one will write 10 ones to the serial port. And then it will write a new line and carriage return. Okay. Then when thread two runs, it will do the same thing. It will send 10 twos to the serial port, new line carriage return. So this is my desired output. 10 ones from thread one, new line carriage return. 10 twos from thread two, new line carriage return. 10 ones, 10 twos, 10 ones, 10 twos, and so on. But what I actually get uh, is like this. It's messed up, you know. This is like the case where I say just now we got an office, uh, there is only one printer. So you got two guys uh, trying to send things to the printer at the same time. So the printer will print a bit from the first person, print a bit from the second person, print a bit from the first person, print a bit from the second person, and so on. So this is not what we want. Okay. So how can we change from the observed output to our desired output? We can control access to the shared resource using semaphore. Okay, this is how we do it. So it's the identical code, just that we add the orange color is what we added. So you see what we added here is we created uh, we created a semaphore ID container. OS semaphore ID is a type la, data type. It's a semaphore ID container. So the name of the semaphore ID container is sem ID is to store the semaphore ID. Where do you get the semaphore ID? Here. When you use OS semaphore create to create the semaphore, it will return you with the ID. So you store the ID inside the container that we created. So here we created the container sem ID. Right? So OS semaphore create will return you the ID. You store it inside sem ID. Okay. This is the name of the semaphore. See, we, we define the name of the semaphore called SAM. You can call it anything you like. You can call it ABC. If you call it ABC here, then this one must be ABC. Here. This is the initial value of the semaphore. So we created the semaphore with an initial value of one. That means the resource by default is available. That means the toilet by default, the door is open. There's nobody inside. Okay, so uh, when thread one runs, before you start using the serial port, the shared resource, uh, you need to see if it's available. So OS semaphore wait. You wait for the semaphore. You see, is someone using the serial port? So this is the ID of the semaphore, and you're going to wait forever if it's not available. But it's available because you created it with an initial value of 1. So immediately, track 1 starts sending its 1s. Now, in the middle of sending its 1s, track 1, no? His time slice is up. So track one has to stop running and then the task manager switch to track two. Okay, track two uh, sees if someone is using the shared resource, OS semaphore wait, in which someone is because track one is in the middle of using it, right? So track two uh, couldn't get the semaphore because original value is one. When track one got it, it became zero. Man. So track two, when you OS semaphore wait, the value is zero. Uh, so track two cannot continue. Track two goes into waiting state. The task manager switch back to track one. Track one continue until he finish printing all his ones. Then you release the semaphore. Now the moment track one releases the semaphore, track two will grab the semaphore. So when track one releases the semaphore, track two immediately grab the semaphore. But track one is still running. Eh? This is a while one loop. So while while one loop, so track one loops back up here, tries to get the semaphore again, but oh no, the semaphore track two got already, man, right? So track one now has to wait. Task manager switch to track two. Track two is now holding the semaphore, so track two send 10 tools to the stereo port. Ah, so now we get our nice 10 tools here. Then track two release the semaphore, which is immediately obtained by track one, which is waiting, right? Then track two loops back up here, 
Wait for the semaphore again, not available because track one got it. So now, task manager switch to track one. Track one runs again, sends another 10 ones. And that's how we get this output. Okay, so uh, the semaphore uh, is basically uh, a mechanism to control access to a shared resource. You do not let more than one thread use a shared resource at any one time. Okay, it's like a lock. Lah. Okay, now there is a special case of the semaphore. You see, uh, semaphore, right? Semaphore, uh, you can initialize it to any value. So if there are four public toilets, then you can initialize the semaphore to a value of four. If there are four toilets, you can initialize the semaphore to a value of four. So A comes, grab one, semaphore becomes three. B comes, grab another one, semaphore becomes two. C comes, grab another one, semaphore becomes one. D comes, grab another one, semaphore becomes zero. So if E comes, uh, E, uh, let's say got track E come, uh, uh, then E has to wait uh, because A, B, C, and D, they have used up all the available shared resource. Okay, so semaphore uh, can have any value, uh, one or more. Okay, so if you have, if you create the semaphore uh, with a initial value of one, you call that a binary semaphore, binary one or zero. If more than one, you call it a multiplex. Okay, so uh, now, if you only have one, uh, normally we don't use a semaphore with just uh, one. Okay? If you want, if you have only one shared resource, instead of using a semaphore with a value initialized to one, uh, it is better to use a mutex. A mutex is exactly like a semaphore, but the mutex only have one token, only one. So the mutex value can only be zero or one. It is mutex is especially to protect access to only one shared resource when you only have one of the shared resource. That's why we say mutex, mutual exclusion, mutually exclusive. If I'm using it, you cannot use it. If you are using it, I cannot use it. Only one person can use it. Okay. And the difference between mutex and semaphore is Tretza owns the mutex. Threads, uh, they own the mutex. What do we mean by that? If a thread uh, gets hold of the mutex, uh, let's say OS mutex wait, the thread gets hold of the mutex. Uh, if this thread is terminated, uh, the mutex gets terminated together with the thread. Right? It's like this. It's like this. Imagine this toilet uh, got a key one. It's not a lock, uh, there is a key. So when the person goes to use the toilet, he will take the key, go in and lock the door. Right? Uh, then when he finished using, he will come out and put the key back on the door. Now, what happens uh, if he goes in and lock the door, or then he dies inside the toilet? So nobody can get the key again. Nobody can use this shared resource again. Okay? Uh, so uh, mutex, uh, has the additional property of thread ownership. The thread, whichever thread gets the mutex, uh, will own the mutex right, until it frees the mutex or release the mutex again. Right, that's the difference between mutex and semaphore. Mutex has thread ownership and you can only have a zero or one token. Semaphore doesn't have thread ownership. You can have as many tokens as you want. Right? Okay, so we have talked about uh, uh, signals to synchronize thread execution. We have talked about uh, we have talked about signals to synchronize thread execution. Semaphore and mutex to manage shared resource. How about passing data between threads? If threads need to pass data to each other, right? So to pass data between threads, we use message queue and mail queue. Let's see what they are. Right? We start with message queue. Let's talk about the message queue. How does uh, threads uh, pass data between each other? Okay, message queue. Now, uh, why we need a message queue uh, is because uh, we have a thread or an ISR that wants to pass data to another thread or ISR. But the thing is, 
this, this thread may be producing data faster than this thread can use it, or this thread may be getting reading the data faster than this thread can produce it. So when both threads are, we say the producer and the consumer. When the producer is producing faster than the consumer, or the consumer is consuming faster than the producer, we need a buffer in between. Okay, so that's what the message queue is. It's a buffer. It's a first in, first out. The first data that goes in is the first data that comes out, V4. Right? And what type of data can you pass? The B2-bit value. You can only pass a, a small piece of data, which is up to 32 bits. So you can pass 8 bits, 16 bits, or 32 bits. Or you can pass a pointer because pointer is 32 bit. You know, pointer is address, man. and address uh, maximum size is 32 bits for your Cortex M processor. Lah, right? Okay. So, how do we use the message queue? Uh, you got message queue ID to reference the message queue. You need to define the message queue. That's the name of the message queue. The queue size. What's queue size? How many slots you have here? How big is your buffer? That's the queue size. Data type? What is the data type? Is it integer? Is it a half word? Is it a character? Is it a pointer? So data type. Okay. Then you create the message queue. You can put a message and you can get a message. All right. So let's look at an example. Huh? Let's look at an example. Okay. Here. So here uh, I got three threads. I got, uh, let's zoom out a little bit. Okay. I got three threads. So first, uh, I, I write these three threads uh, separately. One. So this is, my first, this is my first program. I got three programs. Uh. This is my first program. My first program uh, is just blinking an LED on and off. On and off with some certain delay. Uh. On for 100 milliseconds, off for 2,400 milliseconds. Okay, this is my first program. My second program is uh, show something on LCD. So I initialize the LCD. Put the cursor on the first line and then send ready to the LCD. Then do for me. Okay, fine. Then I have my third program. My third program here, uh, this is my third program. Uh. So my third program, um, here I start the ADC conversion. I wait for the conversion to complete. And then I get the result, store it into this variable called ADC result. And then I check if the result is more than 1,000, I'm going to turn off LED2. Right? Otherwise, uh, I keep the LED on. Oh, sorry. If the result is less than 1,000, I on the LED. Otherwise, I turn it off. Then I wait 5 seconds. I wait 5,000 milliseconds or 5 seconds before I do it again. Okay? So I got these three separate programs here. What we want to do is, I want to combine these three programs to run together at the same time using RTX. Okay? And also, I want to add a few stuff. I want to use ADC interrupt. I don't want to keep checking whether the ADC conversion has completed or not. I want to use ADC interrupt to tell me that the ADC conversion has completed. I want to display the ADC result on the LCD. And given uh, the system tick is one milliseconds. Okay, so the first thing that we do is now, same thing here, uh, you can see here uh, the main function, we initialize the kernel and then we start the kernel. Okay, we create three threads. One thread is the LED thread, the LCD thread, and the ADC thread. We create three threads because we got three things running at the same time. We create three threads. And then I need to, the LCD need to display the ADC result. Uh, so I need to pass the ADC result from the ADC thread to the LCD thread. How do I pass it? Eh? I use a message queue. So I create a message queue. Okay. All right. So let's look at your uh, LED thread. The LED thread is very straightforward. You just copy everything. Right. Uh, instead of wait MS, we use OS delay. So wait MS 100 milliseconds. So it just happened my system tick is one millisecond, so I always delay 100, no? and then always delay 2,400. No? Okay, that's done. All right. Now, how about the ADC thread? ADC thread, uh, 
uh, I need to use interrupts. Uh. So you notice here that I have my ADC IRQ handler. Over here is commented, it's commented, but here I, I need to use it. Okay, so what do I do? Just now you learn about the signal set signal. So when the when the ADC IRQ handler runs, uh, you signal the ADC track to run. All right, you signal the ADC track to run. This is just to clear the flag, uh, intra flag. So when the intra happens, you clear the ADC track, you set the ADC track to run. Okay, what does the ADC track do? So you see the ADC track here. Uh, you see the ADC track here. Uh, we uh, we start the conversion. We start the conversion, All right? Oh, by the way, uh, this one should be enable IRQ. Uh, there is a typo here because we are using interrupts, uh, so we cannot disable the IRQ. This is enable IRQ, uh, enable IRQ. So you enable the ADC interrupt. Then you start the ADC conversion, and then you go to a waiting state. So you wait long until the ADC conversion complete. Other tracks can run now, right? So when the ADC conversion complete, uh, the ADC handler will run, and it will signal the ADC track to run. So the ADC track will then get to run. It will read the results into ADC result uh, variable, and then you put this message on the message queue, right? This is the message queue. So what is the message ADC result? So you put the result, this data that you want to send on the message queue, okay? And the timeout is zero, means no timeout. You, immediate, you, you immediately put the value on the message queue. You don't wait, just put it straight away. Then uh, this code is the same. Basically, you're just checking if the ADC result is less than 1,000. If it is, turn on the LED, otherwise turn it off. OS delay 5,000. Okay, done. And lastly, the LCD thread. Uh, so the LCD thread, we need to modify it to display the ADC result, right? Okay, so the LCD thread, what it does is, it's basically OS message get. You are waiting for a message from the message queue. And you keep waiting. You wait forever. Uh. So if there's nothing there, uh, the LCD thread goes into a waiting state. Uh. You just wait. Now, the moment the ADC thread puts a message on the message queue, the LCD thread will be able to run. Uh, it will go to a ready state, getting ready to run. Then during its turn, uh, it will um, grab the message, put it into result, put it into result. Now you notice that uh, OS message get, uh, you see this OS message get, uh, its return type is OS event. OS message get, returns you with OS event. So OS event uh, is a data structure. Let me show you what OS event is. OS event uh, is a data structure. Okay, you see this is, this is OS event. It's a data structure. Type defined structure OS event. There are three members in this data structure. Status, signals, and def. Okay. So what we want is the signals. So you, you extract the signals member of OS event, and then you get the V, which is value. This is the value. So it depends on your message. Are you passing a 32-bit value, or are you passing a pointer? So if you are passing pointer, then you get it with the P. Otherwise, you get it with the V. Right? So value.v or value.p. Value, this member, uh, not signals, uh, value. Value.v or value.p. So in our case, we are passing a 32-bit value. Uh, so value.v, we extract value.v. Okay, all right, so let's go back there. So now we know what is a OS. Now we know what is a OS event already, right? Now you know what is OS event already. Yeah? So when you get the message, you, you store it into this result. You notice that result, is a type OS event. Okay, so this is the top of your program. You see, at the top of your program, you have to include all those files that are used by these three separate programs. You have to put all of them in. Add one more CMC's OS.h. Then these are the track ID, track function prototype, track defines. Then this is the message ID, message define. And this is the OS event uh, container. The OS event container, we call it result. So then 
when you get a message, when you get a message from the message queue, you put it into the container, result container. Okay, then you print on the LCD, uh, you print uh, so you print ADC result is print in decimal format. Uh, percentage D means print in decimal format. So what you want to print? Result dot value dot v. Okay, just now you saw in result. Result is a data structure. Uh, so you want the, va the, the value member and then the v. Okay, so result.value.v, you print out, and this will be the whatever was sent by the ADC thread. Uh. Just now, whatever he sent, uh, you can grab it here and display it on the LCD. Okay, all right, so this is how we use a message. But you see, uh, there is one slight disadvantage. Message queue can only send data up to 32 bits. Each piece of data is 32 bits. What if you want to send data that is larger than 32 bits? Ah, then we use a, we call it a mail queue. We call it a mail queue. Okay. So you see here, a mail queue is actually a message queue and a memory pool. It's actually two things. So when you use the mail queue, you are actually creating a message queue and a memory pool at the same time. Or if you don't want to, you can separately, you can separately create a message queue and separately create a memory pool. Now, how is it used? Uh, the memory pool, the memory pool, you define it, give it a, a pool ID, you, you give the pool a name, the size of the pool. Size of the pool means how many blocks of memory you want inside the pool. So these are blocks of memory. Yeah. How many blocks of memory you want inside the pool? And then each block, uh, each block, uh, what is the type? Okay, so let's say now, uh, let's say uh, if you want, let's say if you want uh, to, to transfer 100 bytes of data, if you want to transfer 100 bytes of data, then the data type, uh, you just create a structure with 100 members, uh, right? You type define, use type define to create a new data type. That new data type uh, is a structure with 100 members. And then you put it here. So this data type is a structure with 100 members. Then each block uh, will have 100, uh, is a structure with 100 members. Uh. So what's the member? Let's say each member is an integer. Then each block will have 100 integers. Okay. So data type, you specify according to this, how big you want the block to be. Uh, right? Then you use OS pool alloc to grab a byte, uh, grab a block of memory. Then you can fill up the block of memory with data. And then you, what you give, what you send uh, is not the block of memory. What you send is a pointer to this block, right? pointers to memory blocks. So the difference between uh, mail queue with message queue uh, is message queue can send data or pointers. Mail queue can only send pointers. Right? So you can either separately create a message queue or a memory pool and a memory pool, or you don't want to create two of them separately, you can create a mail queue, which will build these two for, at the same time. It's automatic, it will create a message queue and a memory pool, and together they are called a mail queue. Okay? All right, so uh, now we have gone through uh, all the all the materials uh, for RTOS. RTOS is just a library. Uh, just a library. So we have gone through all the materials for the RTOS already, right? And you can start uh, working uh, on your section B of your lab, right? Section B of your lab, uh, you can see from here. Uh, section B of your lab, uh, lab one until lab, uh, lab one to lab 10. Lab 1 to lab 10 uh, is on uh, threads and timing, right? Okay. Not 1 to 10. 1 to 7. Uh, lab 1 to 7 is on threads and timing. Lab 8 to 18 is on uh, inter thread communication. So all these labs, uh, they are all ready, readily built for you already. So you just need to open the project, go in, uh, press build, and then run the simulator to observe uh, all these concepts uh, working, how they work, right? Because now we are just 
in lecture we just talk theoretically ma. how does the actual thing work eh? uh, so you go through these 18 labs they are very short simple labs go through them to understand how the how these rtos api functions uh, are used okay now, once you have completed this uh, you can then move on to do your uh, assignment two right you can then move on to your assignment two okay assignment two all right so you can start your assignment two already right, you can take a break right? just finish your assignment one right? just take a few days break then you can start your assignment two so your assignment two is due on week 13 uh, same you just write a report and submit right it's 50 percent of your coursework the other 50 percent is your assignment one right? So what you do in assignment two is, I just give you a brief outline. You write three separate programs. The first program is a simple running light program. Ah, and this one, uh, assignment two, uh, you're using LPC 1768. Right? No more STM32F. Uh. Uh, but good news is LPC 1768 is much simpler. Uh, right? So you write a program for project A running lights, just some running lights, simulate it, okay, ready? Then, Project B, you write a program to play some music on the speaker. You can also you can simulate all of this uh, using PWM. Okay, once it's done, then you write a third program to read ADC value, read ADC value, and then uh, display it on the serial port. So your uh, Kill Microvision simulator uh, it has a serial port uh, emulator. Right. You can send something to the serial port and the emulator will display whatever you send. Okay, so you write these three separate programs. Now, after you have finished writing these three separate programs and fully tested them already, so you write your report down on these three separate programs and all your tests and results all done already, then part two of this assignment is you combine the three programs uh, to run at the same time using uh, the RTOS. Uh, that's all. So this is uh, your second assignment. Uh, after you complete this, then you know how to use uh, RTOS uh, quite proficiently. Okay. All right. Let's let's go on to the last part of today's class, which is um, which is uh, quiz nine. All right now, let's discuss quiz nine. Quiz nine. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Fully submitted. Huh? All right, let's this let's look at quiz nine. Oh, by the way, uh, let me take your attendance. I think there is a few more. Maybe you just came in or you just came in during the mid set middle just now. Okay, let me take your attendance. Uh, Chu Zhang Hing, are you here? Chu Zhang Hing. Chu Zhang Hing, are you here? Uh, Han Jin Shen, are you here? Okay, thank you. Yong Wing Liang, Yong Chi Ye. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, Zhang Hing, see here. Chu Zhang Hing, Zhang Hing Chu. Zhang Hing Chu. Wu Zhang Hing is not here. Okay, right, never mind. It's okay. okay, let's look at the quiz nine. Right now, first of all, uh, which of the following statements best describe OS event? OS event when it is used for a message queue. When you use OS event for a message queue, OS event, you know, it has a union for different types of data retrieval, right? OS event, uh, you have a union uh, for different types of data retrieval, right here. See? OS event, you have a union, right? You can retrieve data as a W2-bit value, or you can retrieve data as a pointer, or you can retrieve uh, signals. So the union allow you to retrieve data in different ways. Okay, right. So as a union for different types of data retrieval. Okay, next one. When developing an RTOS application, why is the code 
to service microcontroller interrupts. Oh. The code, oh, you don't put the code inside the interrupt handler, but you put the code uh, in a thread. Why? Uh, just now we, we explained. Uh, because you want to avoid uh, disrupting the RTOS operation. Okay. Because the RTOS works uh, by periodically. Every time the system timer uh, expires, uh, you there will be it will call the scheduler and the RTOS functions uh, to do the background work. Right. If you put a lot of code in your interrupt handler, then while the processor is running your code in the interrupt handler, it cannot run the RTOS uh, functions in the background. So the whole RTOS operation uh, is uh, messed up already. So in order to avoid disrupting the RTOS operation, uh, you don't put your interrupt code in your interrupt handler. You put the code out, you copy all the code out, you put it inside uh, a thread. A special thread you give that thread high priority la. okay so the purpose is to avoid delaying calls to the rtos uh, scheduler the task manager and the rtos uh, functions okay All right next one uh, which of the following semaphore usage is the least appropriate we can use semaphore to uh, trigger the execution of other threads yes we can use the semaphore to stop multiple threads, each at a certain point in execution, then resume all of them. Synchronization, fine. Token created by a thread to inform availability of new data. This is fine, but shared via global variable. This is wrong already. Now, in an operating system, we do not use global variables. Right? Uh, in in a uh, operating system environment, uh, we try not to use global variables. If you want to pass data from one thread to another, uh, you use message queue to pass data. Right? It's very dangerous to use global variables. Why? Uh? Because you create a global variable, uh, this global variable may be uh, accessed uh, by more than one thread. If you have two, a few threads are uh, trying to access the same global variable at the same time, uh, then you will have problem data corruption. One thread is reading, another thread is writing to the same global variable. You're going to have data corruption. So it's dangerous. Uh, we avoid using global variables uh, in an RTOS environment. If you want to share data, you use message queue. Okay. All right, next one. Uh, what is the main difference between mutex and binary semaphore? Uh, thread ownership. Uh? Right. Binary semaphore uh, doesn't own the thread doesn't own the binary semaphore, but the thread uh, when it when it gets the mutex it will own the mutex, okay, and die together with the mutex if the thread gets terminated. Uh. Okay, next one. Uh, which of the following best describe best describe best when you see best describe what means the answers are, are all correct but there is one best answer. Best describe the difference between queues. Use in message queue and mail queue. What's the difference? Message queue and mail queue. Quite obvious. Uh. Mail queue, you can only pass pointers. Right? Message queue, or uh, you cannot. Message queue, you can pass pointers and data. But mail queue, uh, you can only pass pointers. Uh, this is the main difference. Uh. Okay. Um, next one. How does the memory pool extend message queue functionality? How does memory pool uh, uh, make your message queue function better? The memory pool allow you to transfer complex data because uh, you can put the complex data inside the memory pool and then you send a pointer, use the message queue to send a pointer to this uh, complex data to another track. So the other track can then get the complex data using the memory pool. So memory pool is a way for you uh, to send blocks of large amounts of data between one track to another. You don't send the data itself, you send the pointer. Okay, right, so you can transfer complex data between tracks using pointers. Uh, and lastly, oh, that's not the last one. Uh, what is the maximum number of threads that a single track can be directly synchronized with? If I got one track now, how, how many other tracks can I synchronize it with? You can synchronize it with uh, the D1 other tracks. 
because you got 31 flags, right? You got 31 flags. Your thread uh, got a maximum of 31 flags. So one thread can be synchronized uh, maximum with 31 other threads. Uh. Okay? All right. And uh, which of the following is not a feature of message queue? It's not LIFO. LIFO means last in, first out. Last in, first out uh, is uh, last in, first out is your stack. Your stack is last in, first out. The last one to go in is the first one to go out. That's your stack. Okay. Your message queue is a 5 4. First in, first out. The first message to go in is the first message that comes out. Okay. So not, not a feature is a live follow. Okay. Uh, almost on time. I'm, I'm late almost every time. Right? Today we are almost on time. Three o'clock almost. Still a bit late. All right. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming today. Do you have any questions before we stop our class here? Everyone okay? No questions? All right, so uh, we will stop here for today. Thank you, everyone. And I will see you in your next uh, tutorial class, the next group tutorial. Okay, thank you, everyone.